What do you know about laser cutters? I didn't know too much about them except that they look cool and I wanted one. And Glowforge seemed to be the must-have brand. I've wanted one from the first time I saw their Kickstarter years ago and I finally decided it was time to get one. And so far, I've been impressed with it. Let's walk through a quick unboxing of the Glowforge, do some demo cuts, and we'll cover the setup, some info on safety so we don't kill ourselves, then talk about exactly what a laser cutter does and the difference between engraving, cutting, and scoring, as well as discuss the use of masking tape, and finally some thoughts on venting fumes. So stick around as I share what I have learned so far with you. Welcome to Maker at Play. If you're new here, I'm Michael, and I like to make things. Normally these things are made out of wood and have electronics inside of them, and those electronics run code. And I share all the details of how I build my projects on this channel and my other two channels dedicated to woodworking and programming. I'd love to have you as part of the Maker at Play community. That's my way of calling you to action hit that subscribe button. I ordered my Glowforge in February, and it arrived via UPS in April. It took 49 days from placing my order to the day it arrived at my house which I know is nothing compared to the early Kickstarter backers who had to wait a year or more for the first units to ship. I've become used to getting things in a day or two via Amazon, so it seems rare when I have to wait over a month or something. I'm not sure if the delay is because they still have such a high demand for their laser cutters, or is it a result of supply chain issues caused by a pandemic. But I will give them credit that when I placed my order, I was told that it would take this long, so there were no surprises. If you're thinking about getting a Glowforge, there's a referral link in the description below that could save you $500 and help me pay for mine which is a great win-win for the both of us. So please consider using that link when you buy one. My first observation when the Glowforge arrived was this thing is much bigger than I envisioned. The true size of this device can't really sink in until seeing it in person. Watching videos and reading the dimensions didn't really do it justice. You definitely need two people to safely move this thing around. It comes packed very well and you want to make sure that you don't destroy the box as you open it. You'll want to save the packaging in case you need to send the Glowforge back for any warranty work. New packaging from Glowforge will run you 250 bucks, so this big ass box will be heading into my attic just in case I need it again someday. Glowforge setup was quick and simple. They provide a nice step-by-step -step instructions for unpacking everything and getting the Glowforge ready to power on for the first time. It is packed really well to prevent damage during shipping, so there are some safety screws and tape that need to be removed to allow the print head to move freely. This was a simple task that was clearly explained in the setup instructions. Once the Glowforge is powered on, then you're going to need to take your computer or your smartphone and connect to the Glowforge that acts like a Wi-Fi hotspot. And this is how you will get the Glowforge connected to your home network. Not working with a laser cutter before, I made sure to read through all the safety info. Basically, I learned that the most likely way this thing will kill me is from the fumes that it puts off when cutting. There are certain types of materials that can put off very harmful fumes. For example, cutting PVC is a very bad idea because it will put off hydrogen chloride gas, which can be deadly when inhaled. Secondary hazards are the possibility of fire and eye damage from the laser. To mitigate fire risk, you should never leave the Glowforge unattended when it is running. Also, keeping the lid closed will protect your eyes from any laser reflection. Biggest risk mitigation, though, is to know what materials you are cutting and is it safe to cut. You don't want to just throw random stuff in the Glowforge to cut. You need to do some research first that the material you want to cut will not put out harmful fumes. Because not only can the fumes be harmful to breathe, they can also damage the Glowforge. For example, when you cut PVC or vinyl, it will put off hydrogen chloride gas and can mix with moisture in the air and turn into hydrochloric acid and start eating your laser cutter. Here's a photo of a laser cutter that was used to cut a lot of vinyl stickers. This is also a good time to talk about routine maintenance of the Glowforge. The manual gives you info on how you need to clean the lens and mirrors inside the Glowforge after 40 hours of use. All those fumes that you see and smell when using a laser are also collecting on all the parts inside the Glowforge. It is important to keep the path of the laser being clean, so this means wiping off the lenses and mirrors to remove any particle buildup. So what can you really do with the Glowforge? At its most basic, the laser just removes material using a very narrow beam of infrared light. What makes this so useful is the software that controls exactly where that laser is pointed and its power level, which gives you a lot of control over exactly what material to remove. The Glowforge provides three ways to remove material. It can cut, score, and engrave. A cut is just like it sounds. It cuts all the way through the material, just like if you were to use an X-Acto knife, but a lot easier and more precise. A score is pretty much just like a cut, except it doesn't go all the way through the material. It basically just draws a line on the material. To score, the laser lowers the power and moves quickly along a path. It's a nice quick way to create a bold visual effect because scoring is much faster than engraving. Engrave is used to remove small amounts of material that create contrast, resulting in printing an image on the material. 
Cut and scores are alike because they require a different kind of file than what an engrave action requires. Cuts and scores require paths, and these paths come from vector images as opposed to raster or bitmap images. Another way to think about it is the vector paths used for cuts are just like the G-code used in a CNC. In fact, I kind of expected the Glowforge to accept G-code like any other XY plotting device, but it doesn't. They decided to have the Glowforge controlled from their software in the cloud. This design decision is what makes the Glowforge so easy to use and popular, but I also think it adds some risk to you as the owner of the device. Without the Glowforge cloud, you have nothing more than a big paperweight. So you have to count on that the Glowforge cloud will never go away. This also means you will not be using your Glowforge when your network is down. Whereas my CNC and 3D printer work just fine with no internet connection. With cutting, there is not much to think about on the settings. Either it cuts all the way through the material or it doesn't. You can adjust the laser power based on the thickness of the material you are cutting. You don't want to just go at everything at 100% power as you just might set your project on fire. For example, to cut through an eighth inch wood, I'm using 100% power. But to cut through a sheet of paper, I'm only using 40% power. Compared to cutting, engraving is a bit different. You can think of engraving more like a dot matrix printer that prints on paper. Do you remember what dot matrix printers are? Might be dating myself there. The laser goes back and forth in lines across the material just like a printer. And it varies the power of the laser beam when it wants to draw a dot or a pixel at that current location on the material. When it comes to engraving, there is a lot more to think through with the settings. Now, of course, you can just take the default settings and things might work fine, but you can also fine tune things if you like. To get a little more practice with engraving and to understand the power settings more, I downloaded a test template and played with it on some medium draft board. Note that the final effect of the engraving for a given power level is going to be different for different wood types and materials. In my first example, we can see the impact of the lines per inch setting. Here I use 35 lines per inch and you can see exactly how much space is left between each line. This really wasn't the look I was going for, so on my next test, I used 225 lines per inch. As you can see, the smaller the number, the more space that is left between each line. So keep this in mind when planning what you want your final results to look like. It seems that 225 lines per inch is the default and provides a nice result. Next, I played with the grayscale setting and tested the difference between convert to dots and vary power. From what I've read, vary power seems to provide the best results on materials that provide better contrast when burned. Where convert to dots works well on material like aluminum where there is not much contrast. You can see the difference between the two on this sample of draft board. This circle was done with convert to dots, where this one was done with very power. You can see the biggest difference between the two settings when you get below 25% power. Another thing that you can see on this sample draft board is the impact of masking tape when used with engraving. This sample was done with masking tape over the board. First observation is that any engraving done with 20% power or less didn't even make it through the masking tape, so it didn't even engrave into the board. And starting around 45% power, it engraved the masking tape but still left the glue of the tape behind, which is hard to get off. This tells me that I don't want to use masking tape for engraving with less than 50% power. Now, if we look at this example where I did the engraving with no masking tape on the board, we can see that everything below 50% power turned out nice. But above about 85% power, our board was stained from fumes. So this is something to keep in mind, that if your engraving is going to be over 80% power, you might want to use masking to prevent having to sand the board later. I also recommend using masking for cuts, since cuts are normally full power, they are going to give off enough smoke and fumes to stain the material. Up to this point, I've been using the Glowforge in my garage and venting the fumes out the garage door. But I want to move the Glowforge into my office space. So I built this adapter for one of the windows in my office that will accept the vent hose from the Glowforge and vent the fumes outside. It was easy to make. I designed the hose adapter in Fusion 360 and printed it on my 3D printer and then cut the hole in the plywood on my CNC to accept the hose adapter. I must say, I was excited to use my 3D printer and my CNC to make something for my laser cutter. It was like combining all my digital fabrication tools into one project. I felt like a modern day maker. I've already used my laser cutter to create a Mother's Day gift for my wife that turned out really nice. I will post a full build video of that project on my woodworking channel, so make sure and go over there and check it out. And don't forget to use the referral link below to save $500 when you buy your Glowforge. Let me know what awesome things you make with a comment below or tag me on your social media posts. I love seeing other people's projects. So now go make something.